The following presentation covers the returns from the 1820 census, the fourth census conducted by the United States government. The 1820 census was initiated under the administration of James Monroe, with Secretary of State John Quincy Adams supervising the census itself. In 1820, 23 states have achieved statehood, with Missouri slated to be the 24th state in 1821 due to the recent Missouri Compromise. So in 1820, Missouri is a territory slated for statehood. Below Missouri is the Arkansas Territory. To the far north is the Michigan Territory. So only 30 years after the initiation of the constitutional government in 1789, the United States already had nearly half of its current states formulated. The recent War of 1812 and associated conflicts had solidified western boundaries. In the north, the defeat of Tecumseh's Native American alliance during the War of 1812 opened the Great Lakes region, the Northwest Territories outlined by the Articles of Confederation government in the 1780s, for settler expansion. Thus, the defeat of Tecumseh paved the way for Indiana's statehood in 1816 and Illinois statehood in 1818. In the South, the War of 1812 saw the defeat of the Creek Nation which opened the Southwest to expansion. Mississippi achieved statehood in 1817, and Alabama entered the Union in 1819. Nearly 20 years before 1820, Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase had already resulted in the first state west of the Mississippi River, Old French Louisiana. Louisiana became a state in 1812. The Missouri Compromise of 1820, the year of this census, resulted in the creation of two states, one free and one slave. Slavery had emerged as a national contest between North and South at this stage, with the Senate matching the admission of a slave state with the admission of a free state. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise seized the admission of free Maine, which until now had been part of Massachusetts, with the admission of slave Missouri slated for 1821. So we can see how the boundaries of the country changed dramatically between the 1810 and 1820 census with the addition of several states in a short period. Yet another boundary was set to expand in 1820. At this time, Florida's status is in transition from Spain to the United States. Negotiations are in process for Spain to cede Florida to the United States with the promise that Spain will retain Texas. Spain has been in Florida for over 250 years at this time. The total population of the United States in 1820 was 9.6 million people. The United States population had increased 33% since the previous census in 1810. We will go through the states and territories in descending order by population. New York was the most populous state in 1820 with 1 1.4 million people. Pennsylvania recorded just over 1 million residents in 1820. Virginia was the third largest state and the largest southern state, recording 938,000 souls. North Carolina is emerging at this time as a robust southern state with 639,000 residents. Ohio, less than 20 years old in 1820, already had 581,000 citizens and it was already one of the most populous states. Kentucky had 564,000 people in 1820. Massachusetts, 200 years after the arrival of the Mayflower in 1620, boasted 523,000 souls. South Carolina counted 503,000 people in 1820. Tennessee counted 423,000 residents. Maryland recorded 407,000 people. Georgia's population was at 341,000 in 1820. The newly realized free state of Maine, delineated from Massachusetts in 1820 in order to check the entry of the new slave state Missouri, had 298,000 people. New Jersey counted 278,000 residents in 1820. Connecticut's population stood at 275,000. New Hampshire counted 244,000 people in 1820. Vermont tabulated 236,000 residents. Louisiana, the first state west of the Mississippi River, had 153,000 people in 1820. 
The new state of Indiana counted 147,000. The new state of Alabama had a population of 128,000 people. Rhode Island had a population of 83,000. The new state of Mississippi had 75,000 residents in 1820. Delaware had 73,000 souls in 1820. Missouri, the new slave state of the Missouri Compromise to balance the new free state of Maine, had 67,000 residents. Another new western state, Illinois, had 55,000 residents in 1820. In the southwest, the Arkansas Territory had 14,000 people in 1820. The Territory of Michigan, the far northwest in 1820, had 9,000 intrepid settlers at this time. The 1820 census is the first census in which a city in the United States surpassed 100,000 people. And that giant city is New York City, the largest city in the nation by far in 1820, with 124,000 residents. The second largest city was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, half the size of New York City at 64,000. However, when the adjacent Northern Liberties Township and Southwark District populations are included with Philadelphia proper, the population of Philadelphia increases to 99,000. So Philadelphia and its adjacent communities are just under 100,000 people in 1820. Baltimore, Maryland is the third largest city in the nation at 63,000. Boston proper had 43,000 residents. New Orleans, an old French city now in the state of Louisiana, was the largest city in the South with 27,000 people. Charleston, South Carolina, is the other major southern city in the nation with 25,000 residents. The capital city in the District of Columbia, called Washington City in the 19th century, had 13,000 residents in 1820. Salem, Massachusetts, just north of Boston, had a population of 13,000. Salem is a good measure for a large city in 1820. A town with about 10,000 people would be a major urban area at the time. The 1820 census tabulated free citizens and slaves in order to determine congressional representation for each state. Thus, we know how many slaves were in each state in 1820. 1 1.8 million people, or nearly one in five residents, were African American in 1820. Of these, 1 1.5 million were slaves, or about 16% of the total United States population were slaves in 1820. 234,000 African Americans were freemen, or about 13% of the African American population was free in 1820. We will go in order from least enslaved states to the most enslaved states. The new state of Maine, following the tradition of its parent state, Massachusetts, had no slaves in 1820. There were 928 free African Americans in Maine. Massachusetts had no slaves and 6,740 free African Americans. New Hampshire had no slaves in 1820. New Hampshire had 786 free African Americans. Likewise, Vermont had no slaves. There were 903 free African Americans in Vermont in 1820. Ohio has zero slaves in 1820 in accordance with the Northwest Territory legislation. Ohio recorded 4,700 free African Americans. So five states, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Ohio, had zero slaves in 1820. The next tier of northern states had nearly abolished slavery with the percentage of slaves less than 1% of the total population. Rhode Island had 48 slaves, less than a fraction of 1% of the population. Rhode Island had 3,554 free African Americans. Connecticut had 97 slaves out of a total state population of 275,000. 7,870 free African Americans were in Connecticut in 1820. Pennsylvania also had essentially emancipated slavery by this time. There were 211 slaves in that year out of a total state population of 1 million people. Pennsylvania had 30,200 free African Americans, the largest population of free African Americans in the North. There were 10,088 slaves in New York State in 1820, 
which still amounts to less than 1% of the state's population because New York was such a large state. New York's free African American population was three times higher than its enslaved population with 29,300 free African Americans in New York State. Moving to the Midwest, the new state of Indiana had 190 slaves, less than 1% of the population. Indiana, as part of the Northwest Territories, is supposed to have zero slaves, but the new laws have not yet been fully enforced among the settlers. However, Indiana had some 1,200 free African Americans. Even further to the West, the new state of Illinois had 917 slaves, about 2% of the population. This higher proportion of slaves for a northern state at the beginning of Illinois' history may have to do with the settlement by some southern families. However, Illinois is ultimately required to forbid slavery due to the Northwest Treaty legislation. Illinois counted 457 free African Americans. New Jersey had 7,557 slaves in 1820, about 3% of the state population. However, there are 12,500 free African Americans in New Jersey, meaning that there were about twice as many freemen in New Jersey as slaves. So in 1820, of all the northern states, New Jersey has the highest percentage of slaves at 3% of the total population. We will cross the Mason-Dixon line and the percentage of slaves will dramatically increase. Delaware is an interesting case. Delaware's laws make it a slave state. However, socially, Delaware is more like New Jersey than Virginia. Delaware had 4,509 slaves in 1820, about 6% of the population. Delaware's free African American population stood at 13,000, or three times its slave population. So Delaware is a slave state that is actually more like a northern state than a southern state. Tennessee had 80,100 slaves in 1820, about 19% of the population, or about one in five. Eastern Tennessee is Appalachian Mountain country, limiting the range of the plantation economy. So while Tennessee has a much larger proportion of slaves as compared to northern states, we will see that it is on a lower end as compared to other slave states. Tennessee had 2,737 free African Americans. Kentucky had 126,800 slaves, about 23% of the population, a similar ratio to Tennessee. Kentucky also counted 2,759 free African Americans. Maryland had 107,397 slaves in 1820, about 26% of the population, or about one in four people were enslaved in Maryland. However, Maryland also had a substantial free African American population with 39,730, reflecting a mixed tradition of freedom and slavery for African Americans in Maryland. North Carolina counted 205,000 slaves in 1820, about 32% of the population, or about one in three were enslaved in North Carolina. North Carolina also tabulated some 14,600 free African Americans. Alabama had some 41,900 slaves, about 33% or one-third of its total population. Alabama had 571 free African Americans. Virginia had 425,000 slaves in 1820, about 40% of the population. However, Western Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains has a much lower number of slaves than Eastern Virginia. Virginia also counted some 37,000 free African Americans. Mississippi had some 32,000 slaves in 1820, about 43% of the population. That new state had 458 free African Americans. Georgia had 150,000 slaves in 1820, about 44% of its population. Georgia had some 1,800 free African Americans. Louisiana had just over 69,000 slaves in 1820, about 45% of the population. Louisiana had some 10,500 free African Americans. South Carolina had some 
258,000 slaves in 1820, about 51% of the population. So most of the population of South Carolina was enslaved in 1820. South Carolina counted some 6,800 free African Americans. Let's turn to the territories. In the far north, the territory of Michigan tabulated zero slaves in 1820. Michigan counted 174 free African Americans. The Missouri Territory, now slated to be the state of Missouri and the cause of the congressional struggle between the slave and free states in 1820, recorded some 10,200 slaves, about 15% of the population. Missouri counted 347 free African Americans. The Arkansas Territory had 1,600 slaves in 1820, about 11% of the population. Arkansas had 59 free African Americans. Finally, the District of Columbia, which in 1820 included the capital city as well as surrounding areas like Alexandria, now in Virginia, had 6,400 slaves in 1820, about 19% of the district's population. However, the number of free African Americans in the District of Columbia was two-thirds that number at about 4,000 freemen. The United States in 1820 had expanded beyond the Mississippi River. The state of Louisiana had already been established, and Missouri was slated for statehood the following year. The far north was also expanding. The peace following the War of 1812 allowed for settlers to move into the Great Lakes territories. The extreme northwest frontier was now Michigan. By 1820, Almost all the lands acquired from Great Britain to the United States after the American Revolution had been shaped into states, and the first two states beyond the Mississippi River from Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase, Louisiana and Missouri, were delineated. Within a single generation after the formation of the Constitution, the United States was a continental power.